cool. Um, I want to thank everyone today for coming out uh, for the third and final lecture of the 2023 Ellipsis Lecture Series. My name is David Wise, and I'm the art director here at MFG.World, a multi multidisciplinary creative practice partnering with brands and creatives to develop and carry out projects ranging from arts, commerce, fashion, and architecture that help push culture forward. In addition to the studio, we've recently launched MFG.Store, our online and physical platform where we curate, commission, and sell apparel, publications, magazines, accessories, and more. Um, if you were here earlier in those two rooms, we have books, magazines, shirts, apparel. Zach has a pop-up and a bookshelf. Um, if you haven't seen it, definitely check it out before you leave. Um, and for us, community care and partnership are really the values that help us drive and, and push culture forward. Um, it's these values that led us to the Ellipsis Lecture Series, where artists, designers, writers, and makers are invited to share their ideas on what it means for them to push culture forward, specifically anchoring around uh, curiosity and the future. Um, so for those like Zach, who are imagining new ways of shaping brand and design and pushing the boundaries within their profession and their practices, um, we're really grateful and excited to have them come and, and share those ideas with us. Um, I couldn't be more thrilled to um, have Zach here for the third and um, final installment, as well as the first in-person lecture that we've uh, done. Um, I first came across his work when I was in graduate school at Cranbrook Academy of Art. And if you're not familiar with the whole graduate school around design, Cranbrook is, a, is an institute that is really focused on a sort of postmodern bend toward language and image making. Um, things often tend to be layered, chaotic, um, and really visually forward. And Zach's work really represents something different and something refreshing um, compared to that, particularly his practice around bookmaking, zine making, and object making, um, of which can be seen in the really thoughtfully curated kind of installation done in our uh, counter. Um, and for me, it, it represented something smart and clear that was diametrically opposed to what I was exposed to as a young designer. And in addition to that, um, Zach has led the Harvard Art Museum's graphic design department from 2012 to 2022, where he was responsible for the maintenance and evolution of the museum's brand identity, as well as the creative direction and design of all the publications, signage, advertising, other printed and digital communications, and more, which having been exposed to the design department of an arts and cultural institution um, is a very understated and impressive uh, feat that Zach has accomplished over that 10 year career there. Um, so it goes without saying that Zach has inspired, influenced, and even taught some of us here at MFG. And we're both excited and grateful to have Zach um, be a part of this larger design community here in, in Utah. Um, um, so I also want to thank MFG Zach. for putting this on. It's super exciting to be here, see all of you. I wish I could see who is on the internet, but thanks for coming, whoever's out there. Thanks, David, for inviting me. I'm honored. Um, yeah. I hope nobody walks away disappointed. I grew up in Utah. I've been away and moved back last summer after a lot of years. I've been trying to keep up with, go with everything that's going on here related to art and design um, over the last 18 years and have witnessed from afar and really been inspired and encouraged by the growth of companies and other endeavors like MFG. Um, side note, there are three designers working here who, who I had in school as, as students, so I'm proud to see them out in the world doing really cool things. Um, I'm always a little unsure of what people are interested in seeing or hearing. Um, I guess it depends on the audience, of course. Sometimes it's students, sometimes it's mostly professional designers, sometimes it's artists. Um, I think you're probably a mix of a lot of things. So I'm going to show you a variety of work in both art and design. Um, I think there might be some questions about how those two things relate. So I've, I've tried to select and sequence uh, work to in a way that I hope will show you the connections and continuity um, throughout the art and design projects. What you won't see is a lot of other work I'm proud of in both art, design, branding, visual identity, and publishing in, in various media, because we've only got so much time. 
So, uh, this is my chance to use my laser pointer. Um, as I mentioned, I, I grew up here. I went to the University of Utah for undergraduate, um, did visual communication. Uh, from there, I got a job in northern Vermont at this place called JDK Design that's um, now sort of morphed into a different studio, much smaller, but they started out in the early 90s in Burlington, Vermont uh, with Burton Snowboards and kind of grew up alongside them doing branding, uh, snowboard graphics, advertising, um, and then from there kind of branched out into a lot of other outdoor active lifestyle kind of client work, um, as well as eco home goods. So there we worked on a lot of projects from branding, uh, you know, seventh generation and other, you know, projects with Nike, Patagonia, lots of Burton stuff. Um, I was there for about three and a half, four years, and then I decided to kind of make a shift in the trajectory of my career. So I went to grad school. Um, went down to Connecticut and was at Yale for a couple of years. And then after that, kind of wandered around, did freelance, and ended up getting a job uh, at Harvard Art Museums in 2012. So I was there for 10 years and, and left the museums and came here last year. Um, so I'm, I'm really loving being back in Utah, honestly. and. I'm um, excited to try and contribute to the creative landscape of this place. Um, thanks again to everyone and, and for MFG for putting this together. In real life is fun. Um, so into the work, I'm going to show some art projects first. Um, they all, for me, the art and the design projects are, are really the same process, the same materials. It, it feels like the same thing to me. It's just different motivations behind the two things and maybe different places that they'll exist in the world. This piece clock um, is a screensaver that's available out in the shop. There's a static form, a piece symbol, and there's a dynamic form, the face of an analog clock. Both are composed of a single circle around lines that radiate from the center. Combining the forms complicates the function and meaning of each. So the clock face still remains recognizable because of its movements, even though it's slightly more difficult to read. And the piece symbol, now in motion and subject to the mechanics of timekeeping, is constantly changing. It's in progress, always, but never perfect. And this was a, this was a collaboration with a, a brilliant programmer um, named Eric Lee who, who built the whole thing. So with the piece clock, I took two familiar forms and combined them. The goal, the goal there in a lot of this work is to try and see something anew, to refresh our sight and maybe through that our understanding. Uh, with this project, I used the repetition of familiar words to create a self-defining loop. I think it asks the question, what is it to be human, while offering, also offering one possible answer. For me, being human is having language and using it with others to try and make sense of things, including ourselves. Uh, the Bible says that in the beginning was the word. If language is what distinguishes our species from others on the planet, then the word truly is where we began. The philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein said that language floats free of the world. In that way, perhaps language is also where we supposed, supposedly separate from nature and start to exist in a world that is more abstract, metaphorical, and full of ambiguity and questions. A world of the mind, which is exactly where language exists. Like the shadows in Plato's allegory of the cave, language is not the thing. It's only an indicator of the thing. It's indexical, like our index finger, which points to things in the world. I was asked to make something for this uh, temporary empty retail space in downtown Boston, which would for a couple of months exist as a pop-up gallery. 
The space was part of a really cool, bigger project uh, run by my friends Stephanie Lee and Ellen Shakespeare, where they worked with the city of Boston and property owners to turn vacant spaces into shared studios and galleries for local artists. Um, Ellen and Stephanie had already installed this giant red curtain when I came down to see the space, and this is them in, in progress, kind of working on the space, getting it ready to host a bunch of artists' work. Um, and I was immediately in love with the curtain. I think it was just something they had on hand, like how do we separate this space because we can't fill the rest of the space, I mean, whatever this was, an H&M or something. Um, and they had this curtain around, but I thought it really transformed the experience of the room into this, in this theatrically surreal and kind of ominous way. Um, and they kept, they kept the lights off behind it too, which I loved. Um, now that it was empty, uh, this giant red curtain made it seem like some kind of performance was imminent, but it, it just, it raised a question for me. So I wanted to do something that related to the curtain in the space and helped people have the kind of experience that I did upon entering the space. Um, there was almost this terrifying serenity there. Um, the phrase came to mind pretty quickly that seemed like it could work. Um, at first, it seems nonsensical, but there's an aha moment built in, hopefully. Um, usually people had to say it out loud to themselves to realize that it, that it said the great beyond. Um, and in the end, to me, it felt like a, some kind of existential capitalist architectural critique. Um, I kind of wish we could have left like the graveyard of clothing hangers and, and like retail display stuff around, but that was all that was all gone already. More play with words. I made this shirt for uh, the summer solstice, but in retrospect, it's much more appropriate for winter solstice. The is there does is anyone a good or fluent Spanish speaker? How, do, how does it read to you? I request? It's, I think it, I think it reads, because I, I made this, I was trying to learn Spanish, and I was in Mexico City, and I asked some Mexican friends, like, hey, does this make sense? Because these words are really close, and it seems like it could be kind of fun. And they said, yeah, totally, it makes sense. It says, I request a little sunshine. So as long as they're not lying to me, that's what, the, that's what this says, what I, which I feel like is way more appropriate for, for the winter solstice when we're all kind of like wanting some more light. Um, the front of the shirt has some found graphics comparing the circular form of a clock again and, and planetary orbits and spins. Continuing with solstices but moving from word play to image play, this shirt was made for the winter solstice and uses found images from old reference books, things like dictionaries, encyclopedias, uh, textbooks. Um, and it's, it's meant to be a brief and incomplete and admittedly subjective visual history of the Christmas holiday. Uh, it makes reference to, to Coca-Cola uh, and their outsized impact on Christmas and the, the culture around it. Um, it also references the pre-Christian solstice, solstice traditions that were absorbed into Christmas practices and on the back, the realities of planetary positioning that inspired it all in the beginning. Um, over the next few slides, I'll show more examples of collected image work. Can you guys hear me if, as I'm like, okay. Um, which use both collected images and also collected objects like uh, David mentioned in the, the counter in the front, I did like a little installation of some plastic lids. Um, so collected images, collected objects in images as well. Um, and like with language play, here I'm trying to 
stir up the sediments of the mind. It's kind of like a riddle. Um, and without an explanation, you might be asking how the hell these things relate. Um, in this case, they very much do. Like to me, this is, this is very directly all about this winter solstice Christmas holiday. Um, in other cases, I have clear answers. In others, I have no idea or I have lots of answers. I really didn't know I was obsessed with the sun until fairly recently. Um, this graphic is, is, was a, is part of a logo for an oil company that went out of business in the 60s. It was called Sunset Oil, which I always thought was sort of ironic, um, given like a lot of kind of speculation about how much oil there is left. I think, I don't know if people are still talking about it, but there was like, peak oil conversations happening in the early 2000s, like have we reached the peak? Are we like starting to dwindle? Um, so like the idea of sunsetting oil I thought was kind of interesting for an oil company. Um, anyway, I just cropped out oil and made it better. So now it's a picture of a sunset um, and that's it. The paragraphs below on the sweatshirt um, explain where the image came from and that the sweatshirt was made for Feels magazine on the occasion of their first issue. Um, it's, a, it's a really simple move, just cropping an image and putting it back into the world as a new thing. And it, it reminds me of something the late creative director and artist Virgil Abloh often said, which is a thing only needs to be changed 3% to become something new. Um, I'm sure I'm sure that was inspired by Marcel Duchamp, who pioneered the ready-made art object in the early 20th century, and who Virgil often cited as, as a major influence. Um, the most well-known of Duchamp's ready-mades was, of course, his signed urinal titled Fountain, which he exhibited in 1917. Um, and beyond signing and titling an object that he bought in, bought in a hardware store, the biggest and most important move he made was just moving it from one type of space to another, a gallery. Um, and this hits on something in that Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi later described in their book Learning from Las Vegas as the interdependence of context and meaning. So, you know, Andy Warhol did the same thing, move things from the commercial realm into the gallery. Um, and we've seen people ripping, riffing on that for the last 106 years, and I feel like it's still going strong. This cool t-shirt is definitely as important as anything Duchamp or Ablo made. It's available in the shop and also makes use of recontextualization. So the cover, or, or the front, this is the cover of a book on parenting. Um, I just removed the image. Uh, the, the line below it is um, a graph from Google Ngrams charting the historical use of the phrase safe and sound in books. Um, and then on the back, there's a line taken from an old printing of Don Quixote uh, that says, send thee back safe and sound without deceit. And in the middle of the back is just a caption explaining the source of of these various images and texts. So this is like designed by Google search. Um, these next four images have something to do with growing up in Utah and my relationship with the landscape of the Western US. I'm still trying to figure out exactly what that is and making, seems, making things seems like a good way to explore it for myself, try and figure it out. Um, memories from the Great Basin, the deserts, the mountains, and the West in general as a child seem almost fantastical. These places to me still seem magical, but I know a little more about their history than I did as a kid. I still don't know enough. And it's, it's complicated my notions of quote unquote wild lands. Um, and in the past, I don't know, 10 years, I felt like I've had to ask myself, is the notion of wilderness, a wild place, untouched, 
and unspoiled by humans a colonial farce, a marketing ploy, a religious fantasy related to the Garden of Eden and, relig and original sin. In any case, the idea that humans have not had an impact on any corner of the globe is simply not true, not in 2023. Um, for me, landscape photography brings up really mixed feelings. Uh, it definitely inspires awe and connects me to real and true feelings and memories but it also raises questions about motivation, intention, and meaning. How do landscape images contribute to or challenge mythologies of the Western US? Who do they serve and what ideas do they support? In landscape photography, the place becomes a product and more and more our other human products make their way into the landscape. Thomas Jefferson's land ordinance of 1785 suggested the division of Western lands into a perfect grid of one mile parcels in order to expedite the surveying and selling of land. This act in the middle of the industrial revolution seems like a fitting precursor to an era where everything could be divided, packaged, marketed, and sold. Um, I'm not a religious person, but I'm preoccupied with questions like how did this happen and what are we doing and how did we get here and how do we do the right thing? <laughs> um, so I get it. Um, this project was uh, a little exhibition in Provincetown, Massachusetts that was called Travelers. The title is inspired by this little bit of text I found in a children's book. We are all travelers. We travel around the sun. The earth is our spaceship. It takes one year to go once around the sun. So the, the main part of the exhibition was these three light boxes. They're, I think they're like 30 by 40 inches or so. They're just, they're the kind of light boxes you would see used for advertising or like in-store signage somewhere. Um, you might walk into like a T-Mobile and see an ad uh, using one of these. Um, but instead of, instead of the, the expected kind of graphics and messaging, I, I brought in a collection of found images relating to um, kind of like our experience of being travelers around the sun um, and, and our inclination to try and uh, measure things like time and space and make sense of what's going on. The other aspect of this was a, a, an acrylic tray that I designed that was kind of like had the four points of the compass that was on a pedestal in the gallery and I asked people to send me sand if they wanted um, to combine in this in this tray in the gallery. So I got sand from, from all over, Utah and Northern Ireland and Tunisia and New Zealand and New Hampshire and a bunch of places and um, combined it in this tray. And a lot of the sand was really distinctive. I was surprised like how different they were in texture and color, um, material. Um, and you could see that, but as I poured it in and people started kind of, kids would come up and play with the sand and mix it around. It was incredible how it all just, in the end, looked like sand, like the dictionary picture of sand. Sand colored, it just like absorbed all the color and difference. Um, I kept little samples of all the sands that people sent me, like in just in little jars and promised them all that, I would make something with the sand to, to give back to them after the project was over, and it took a few years. But I was playing around with the sand, trying to figure out like what I could do with it. Um, and I realized, just scattering it on the surface of a flatbed scanner, it, it looked like a picture of a starry sky to me. Um, so I thought, all right, well, maybe there's something to do with that. And I realized like all these sands um, 
actually look really different. You know, some of them are super fine, some of them are coarse. The way they fall on the scanner even differs. Like some of them wanted to kind of group and cluster, some of them waved, some of them like this that were more like angular bits kind of bounced around and made this more even distribution. Um, so I ended up making this booklet of, of images of these, these sands. And it's called The Night Sky. And it's a collection of those pictures captured, captured a collection of those pictures of sand captured exactly as it fell on a flatbed scanner and printed at actual scale. Um, and the, the title here is a reference to Jimi Hendrix's song um, where he sings, Excuse Me While I Kiss the Sky. And of course it sounds like Kiss This Guy. And because that's something you can easily do, I think a lot of us hear that instead of Kiss the Sky, which seems a little less common. Um, so I was really interested in that, like misunderstandings, mis mishearing, misseeing, misinterpreting something. Um, you know, sometimes for various reasons, making out the lyrics or even spoken words can be challenging and response to ambiguity. Um, we tend to hear or see or feel or smell or taste what makes the most sense based on the context and our frame of reference. Um, I was also kind of interested in just, it felt like a knockoff or a bootleg or something, you know, like these aren't real pictures of the night sky. Um, and I feel like I'd like to make more work about that, like the way that knockoffs, bootlegs, imposters rely on our inclination to see what we know rather than know what we see. And they all utilize this fast-acting recognition of close enough cues in order to be read as things that have presumably already been vetted by the culture. So like thinking of knockoffs and bootlegs like crust toothpaste, there's like all these examples online that are really great of, of knockoffs that kind of are close enough to the real thing um, that they sort of steal their, their equity. Um, but yeah, anyway, familiarity is just a shortcut to judgment, assuring us that brands, faces, and even phenomena are authentic, trustworthy, and real. Here's one of the spreads, another one of the sands. I think this is the one from New Zealand. It was super fine. And then on the back, there's just a short essay and a description, and there's also a poster folded up in there that um, explores some of the other ideas that were floating around while making the book, like constellations, connect the dots, dot patterns and pixels and the way they like compose the images that we see, diagrams, measurements, and then of course like the limits of our own vision. So black and white and sand and stars are opposite ends of what we're able to see, you know, tonally or scale wise. Um, and one thought that stayed with me throughout was how when faced with the unknown or perhaps even worse, unknowability, the kind of feelings one might be overcome by um, under the darkest skies of a remote desert or on a beach at the edge of the vast ocean where stars and sand are kind of the two things above and below us. We want an explanation, something relatable to our terrestrial experience. And we connect the dots to find lions and crabs in the sky. We measure, map, name, categorize, and assign meaning in an effort to know or at least feel knowing. Um, so there's a massive, nearly perfect sphere of plasma, 4.6 billion years old and just far away enough to make life on Earth possible. It's been our God to find our conception of time and will eventually render our home planet uninhabitable. Meanwhile, here on Earth, we experience frustration, disappointment, sadness, and depression. The reasons for which may be as varied as the people on the planet. Or maybe there's a single overarching reason we expect the impossible. Maybe the reason is chemical or cultural. Maybe it's capitalism. Maybe it's Maybelline. 
One cause there seems to be modest agreement on is the sun, more specifically its absence in some regions during certain times of the year. Um, as you all know, the further you go from the Earth's equator, the less consistent the sunlight gets. In northern and southern latitudes, lack of sun in the winter has led to what's been termed seasonal affective disorder um, or SAD. So in response to light therapy, in response, light therapy products or SAD lamps have been developed to help people get through the darker months. And this little book combines one-star reviews of SAD lamps with stock, stock photography of our sun, the one star keeping us alive. How's everyone doing? You hot back there? Okay, we're, get, we're getting there. I'm doing good on time. I'm hurrying through this. Am I going too fast? I feel, I feel like I'm teaching when you like get up in front of people and nobody wants to respond, but I get it. It's fine. You don't have to. Huh? Okay, cool. We're, you don't want me to just quit? Okay. Um, so from that book to another book, um, books are one of my favorite things to make. Um, in the last 10 years, I've designed I think over 30, and I'm going to share three that I worked on while at the Harvard Art Museums. So this book was a catalog for an exhibition of the same name. Um, the, the exhibition and the book trace the impacts of militarism on the American landscape through the lens of art, environmental studies, and politics. Um, we, we, with, with the in-house design team, um, I think at this time was myself, um, Adam Shurkanowski and Becky Hunt, we explored a lot of different possible directions, did a lot of research, presented three different design directions we were really happy with. And the curator who was super fantastic to work with just loved this one immediately. Um, it took, it, in the exhibition, there are examples of artist books made by activists. Um, and and in, in our research, we were finding a lot of um, also kind of government documents and stuff. And the two things shared a lot of material qualities, like um, just sort of utilitarian approaches to publishing. Um, I think one because of bureaucracy on the side of government and on the other side with the activists, just a lack of funds. Um, so this kind of m finds that spot where the material culture of those two sort of opposing forces um, meet and takes the form kind of of a manual. Um, so there are several different paper stocks throughout. We use this thin colored paper stock, in this case, to um, drop in governmental documents related to the content and the essays throughout the book. Um, so in this case, it was a um, citing of hazardous waste landfills and their correlation with racial and economic status of surrounding communities. So this was um, another reason that this curator, Makita Best, was so great to work with because we brought this idea to the book, like, hey, what if, like, there's a lot of really interesting visual material um, in this timeline that you're making. She had this timeline of, like, from 1970 on of important things that happened in activism, um, in kind of governmental changes, um, in art and environmental um, events. So we, we suggested, like, let's pull out some of the visual culture of that and, like, uh, drop it throughout the book. Um, there's also these interviews with different artists and curators and environmentalists that are on, like, a shorter blue paper. Um, and then this lighter yellow paper just sort of just uh, divided different categories of the book. 
And then in the end, there was this timeline that links back to, on the green paper, all of the different kinds of documents you see throughout the book relating to important moments since 1970 um, in, in you know, environmental issues. And then for, for the exhibition, we made some different products for the shop, and um, we didn't, it was, it was like, a lot of the material in the exhibition was kind of dark, <laughs> um, not exactly uplifting, so we wanted to focus on the more like optimistic, activist side of things. Um, so we took like an excerpt on this tote bag, this is an excerpt from a poem um, that appeared in the book. And then this is like, uh, in the upper left, a, a mailable postcard with uh, seeds in it. So you can, you can kind of tear it open when you get it and plant the seeds to grow some black-eyed Susans. And then a hat. And the Earth graphic was actually from a photograph in the exhibition of the first Earth Day um, protests. And this was lettering that someone had drawn on one of their posters. Okay, um, two more books. This one, uh, called Everyone, was also a catalog for an exhibition at the museums. Um, it was about uh, indigenous art from Australia and kind of combined contemporary indigenous art as well as more historical, contempor or more historical indigenous works of art. Um, and we in the design, we're thinking about indigenous concepts of time um, that are talked about in the book. So time as more of a circular rather than a linear thing. Um, so we proposed printing the title of the book uninterrupted around the entire book. So it kind of continues um, on the spine and then around the foredge. So it's actually printed on the pages on the book block. Dukura did this. Um, so shout out to them, we were pretty impressed. Um, and then inside, this kind of central latitude is used for all the typography. And we kept this stark white background because it felt like an appropriate gesture for the notion of the eternal present, which was in the title of the exhibition. Um, that we kind of imagined as a place where historical and contemporary works of art exist together without any separation of decades or centuries. This last book, um, titled Object Lessons, The Bauhaus and Harvard, was a fresh look at how Bauhaus teachers and artists brought their influential pedagogy and practice from Germany to the United States and specifically to Harvard. Um, founded by architect Walter Gropius in 1919, the Bauhaus was the 20th century's most influential school of art, architecture and design. After it was shuttered from pressure um, from the Nazis in 1933, a lot of Bauhaus artists brought their practices to the United States. Gropius himself took a position there at the Graduate School of Design, um, where he helped establish a collection of Bauhaus material that's since grown to more than 30,000 objects, and it's, it's the largest collection, largest collection outside of Germany. Um, and Harvard kind of became like an unofficial center of the Bauhaus in America. And this, this catalog and exhibition was all about that. For the, for the binding, actually, let me jump back. So the, the, with the exterior, we wanted to connect Germany and, and Harvard. So on the front cover is uh, the Mahali Naj home. This is a photograph of their living room in Germany. I can't remember if it was in Weimar or Dessau or or somewhere else. And on the back is a picture of a dorm room um, at Harvard in a building that was designed um, by someone who went to school with Walter Gropius there at Harvard. And on the, on the bed is actually an Ani Albers um, designed bed sheet. Who, she, you know, she was one of the really primary influential members of the Bauhaus. For the interior, we also took a, a Bauhaus wallpaper and used it as the end papers. 
Um, and we went with a Swiss binding where the spine is not attached to the book block. So it can just kind of lay flat and it feels like an archival kind of collection of documents sitting on the table in front of you. Inside the back cover, we printed a, a scale facsimile of this exhibition program from um, 1930 at Harvard, which was the first exhibition of Bauhaus work in the United States. So just kind of tying it back to that original connection between the two. And the, the typography throughout the book was really inspired by the typography in this, in this brochure. So there was a, a number of essays. Uh, we published the book after the exhibition, so we were able to have photography of the exhibition in, in the catalog. Um, and one more project, uh, and this this will be about it. This was uh, at Harvard Art Museums, where, as David mentioned, we we kind of did any everything um, from managing the the brand identity to signage, advertising, um, labels, catalog, shop products. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, the identity for the museums was originally developed by 2x4 as part of a larger project initiated in 2008 that brought these three different museum, art museums at Harvard under one administration and one roof. Um, and the primary palette was black and white that followed the logic of this new building that they were constructing um, where in deference to works of art, gallery walls, and the whole building was like kind of really neutral shades. Any, anything painted was like white or gray. And the understated, understated treatment provided this quiet backdrop for a super visually diverse range of objects. Um, but we came to feel like um, the museum was going to reopen in 2014. We were closed for this renovation still. The identity was already four years old. Um, and there were some things we needed to address in time for the reopening, which needed to feel momentous. Um, one thing we had been getting a lot of feedback on from people around the museums, curators, and administration was that there was everyone wanted more color. Um, so that was kind of the space we, oper we, we identified as, as an opportunity to introduce something new without actually like trying to redesign what was still kind of a brand new identity. Um, so in her book, Designing Brand Identity, Alina Wheeler writes that distinctive colors need to be chosen carefully not only to build brand awareness, but to express differentiation. And conventional wisdom and lots of other guides on branding uh, suggest that an identity should include one or two primary colors plus a secondary palette of three to five. Um, and the prospect of, ex of, of expanding the color range uh, for a museum, we asked, how could we possibly limit ourselves to a handful of colors to represent this institution that has over 200,000 works of art and this like amazing um, pigment library, one of very few of its kind in the world. Um, like what rationale would even guide the use of such a palette? Like when do you use this color and why? So thinking through that, um, we kind of return to the building analogy where the building is really visually quiet so that the artwork can stand out. And we realized in that analogy, the people were missing, the activity over time, the fluctuations of, of visitors through our spaces. Galleries obviously aren't just walls and art. Um, it's really like the diversity of the people and the activity in the building that bring the whole thing to life. Um, so, the concept that we arrived at was a basically 365 colors. Um, it's a changing time-based color palette. Tying it to the calendar and assigning a color for every single day would also give us a clear logic for when and how to employ them. 
Um, you know, often working with clients, someone just loves purple, and that may or may not work with the kind of visual material that they have, in this case, with curators for an exhibition, or, <laughs> you know, it may just uh, not be good for the, the brand. Um, so this kind of, we felt like, checked a few boxes for us. Um, it gave us a, a distinctive approach to color, um, and it also gave us a way to like not get bogged down in conversations about what color to use when and 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 you know personal personal taste. So you can see it ap applied throughout a lot of materials. We defined some simple guidelines for using the, the 365 colors. Um, if the communication is about a date specific event, use the color of that day. If the event spans more than one day, use the color of the first day or a gradient from the first to the last day. Color can be used for backgrounds. Sorry. Um, don't place images on color. It's really just text and backgrounds. Um, these ensure that the black and white remain like the core of the identity. Um, and the seasonally changing colors help to call attention to like time sensitive events, for instance, on our calendar or in postcards that are going out. Um, in this instance, these are promoting like a season of, of events at the museums. So on the left is the spectrum for fall. So going at the bottom from like September to the top, like early December. And then on the right is, this, is the color range for spring. So at the bottom going from like late winter and then at the top moving through like a spring green and into yellow before we get to summer. This is a, a patch I made last year. Thought it would be a fitting way to end. Um, good reminder. And that's it. Thanks for sweating through it with me.